Okay. Are we copacetic? Uh, we should be live now. So, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the third virtual history bite uh, that we are doing. Today's topic uh, is Maddie's utter story or Bill's utter story. Uh, some of you may be familiar with this, um, but uh, we, uh, I, Bill has been kind enough to offer to do it again and with some updates to it. Um, so Bill Maddie will be our presenter. He is an Albany native uh, who grew up uh, on a local dairy farm. He was a county extension agent for 20 years. Uh, he's my former predecessor as director of the museum and one of our current docents and a, a local historian here. So uh, he's gonna do an excellent presentation for us today. Uh, we would invite people to uh, put any questions they have onto our Facebook page there, and I will keep an eye out for them and ask them at the end of the presentation. Uh, otherwise, I'm gonna hand it over to Bill and get us started. Okay, thank you, Keith. Um, um, first of all, I'll, first of all, I'd like to start out by saying, how did I come up with the title for this program? And uh, I've been known to tell a lot of stories, especially Albany history stories, and also my own family stories as well here at the Albany Regional Museum. And so I've had a reputation for being a storyteller. But since I grew up on a dairy too, uh, we wanted to add uh, a little extra to the story, and that's the utter part of the story. Um, and uh, the one part about Albany's history that kind of gets uh, left out is, is about the dairy industry that was actually here uh, in Lynn County and Albany as well. So, and that's the, the story I would like to share today. Um, well, we, we came up with this title, uh, Maddie's Utter Story. We thought that was quite unique, but then we discovered that uh, somebody stole our idea in uh, Sweetwater Valley Cheese Farm, uh, took the idea uh, actually, they probably came up with it before we did, but it was just a coincidence that uh, this cheese farm uh, in Philadelphia, Tennessee, uh, came up with the same idea for um, telling their story as well about the dairy industry. And that's, I want to get out of the way some of the, the, the puns or the funny stories that uh, using the word utter, um, there are many. And I'll, I'll try to get some of those out of the way, but I'll probably throw in a few a little later on in the program as well. So uh, kind of like, why does a milking stool only have three legs? Because I have the udder. Um, or an udder day, an udder dollar. Or something in the way she moves attracts me like no udder lo lover. So, and why do cows have hooves instead of feet? Because they lack toes. One of my favorites is actually this one. Uh, studies show that cows produce more milk than the farmer, uh, when the farmer talks to them. It's a case of in one ear and out the other. Actually, this is there's some truth to this story. Um, cows do give more milk uh, when they're calm and uh, they're in an environment where there's not a lot of stress. And uh, so talking to the cows, as well as playing music, uh, we in our dairy, we had uh, the radio going and we weren't sure whether rock and roll or easy listening music or jazz or elevator music was the best for milk production. Uh, we weren't, we had, didn't do a study of that, but uh, having some sort of environment uh, that was calming was best for the cows. So try to get all this out of the way, you know, laughing stock, that's, uh, cattle with a sense of humor. So let's get down to the nitty gritty of, uh, of, of why I'm doing this program. Uh, first of all, a lot of people don't realize that there's a variety of dairy breeds where their milk comes from. Uh, there's Guernseys, Jerseys, Holsteins, Ayrshires, or Ayrshires, depending on uh, how you want to pronounce it, Brown Swiss, and also Milking Shorthorn. Actually, in 18... Uh, 90, Dr. Stephen Babcock invented a method of determining the butterfat content of milk, and the test resulted in dairy herd manage, uh, improvement on the farms throughout the country since prior to the development of the Babcock tests. Uh, little was known regarding the comparative value of dairy cows. Each breed offers different um, uh, qualities and quantities of milk production or butterfat. 
So if you didn't like any of those breeds, maybe this is the breed for you, a combination of, of a little bit of everything all in one breed. It'd be nice to have if we could take the best of all the breeds uh, in terms of milk production uh, for the consumer. Um, one of the other things too is a lot of people say, well, there's a bunch of cows out there in the field. It's like, what a cute bunch of cows. Well, it's not a bunch, it's a herd of cows. Herd of what? A herd of cows. Of course I've heard of cows. Well, it's kind of like the uh, Abbott and Costello uh, who's on first story, but uh, there's a variety of, of dairy breeds to choose from. And some that are made up like the lactate uh, blue cow or the red laughing cow. The dairy industry uh, has uh, was important here in the Willamette Valley and was actually in the Albany area was considered one of the best places for uh, having a dairy. Even in the morning Oregonian in February of 1911, it was stated that natural conditions for dairying around Albany are not excelled anywhere. Even in 1914 and 1930, the Spokane, Portland, and Seattle Railway in cooperation with Oregon State Agricultural College promoted the Willamette Valley as a dairying region with the Oregon Dairy Demonstration Train. They included stops um, in Albany and Shed. And at Al the Albany stop, they had, they had a big celebration or big, and made it a big event. Um, and the stop was actually held at the Oregon Electric Passenger Station uh, here in Albany. Uh, there were over 1,300 people in attendance. Uh, the merchants closed their businesses so people could attend. Uh, the Albany High School band played, uh, the Chamber of Commerce provided the lunch, and the day was also combined with a Jersey cattle show at the Bryant Park County Fairgrounds. The people handling the animals here on the, the flatbed on the train were actually 4-H members uh, who were recruited to handle uh, the dairy animals for, the, for this uh, particular demonstration. Even in the, the demonstrations, they showed that you could actually the new equipment where you could actually milk two cows at one time. Well, as compared today, where you can milk several cows uh, in a rotary uh, milking parlor. The campaign resulted in uh, dairy and becoming much more important in Lynn County and the state. The concept of the dairy demonstration tours was so successful that it was duplicated uh, with other agricultural subjects and by other railroad lines and agricultural colleges in other states. The campaign uh, was continued during the early years of the 20th century by Southern Pacific Railroad. The company reduced rates on the shipment of uh, highly bred dairy cattle into the region. Uh, they established uh, reasonable rates for the transport of milk cans uh, and work closely with Oregon State Agricultural College by helping to bring farmers to Corvallis to attend uh, Farmers Institutes. Uh, the Farmers Institutes were the foundation for what we actually know as the Oregon State University Extension Service. Here are a few dairy farmers along with some students attending one of the uh, Farmer Institutes with Dr. Uh, James Withicum of Oregon Agricultural College. Uh, here he is lecturing to, to the a group of uh, farmers. Uh, this is at the OAC uh, Dairy Barn. And um, also um, uh, James Withicum was uh, later known to be, uh, was our 15th governor for the state of Oregon. The simple system of milk production for family use and sale within the community be began to shift to a complicated industry in which milk was shipped uh, long distances and the milk from many herds was mixed together and divided among customers. The change in the marketing system by uh, the shift from a rural to an urban economy brought into existence many new problems, the most important of which was milk sanitation. Uh, safe milk, drinking milk uh, for children was important uh, in the development of what was known as pasteurization. And this made milk safer to drink for everyone. In 1905, uh, Oregon began differentiating uh, milk uh, 
produced for fluids consumption from milk produced uh, for butter and cheese. And this led to the distinction between a grade A dairy and a grade B dairy. Sanitary requirements for the production and handling of milk for the fluid trade was much more rigid and dairy farmers maintaining cows for the purpose of fluid consumption in the cities of 10,000 or more uh, had to apply annually for a certificate of inspection. Uh, this certificate uh, would be revoked if proper sanitation conditions were not maintained in the stables or buildings or the grounds. So here we have a group of cows studying for their grade A uh, or a grade A dairy. Albany uh, has had many uh, creameries over the past 140 years, uh, but wait a minute, I'm getting ahead of myself with my story. I'm gonna talk about this gentleman who was one of the first uh, dairy farmers um, uh, in, in Albany. Um, he, Strouder Froman, along with his wife Ophelia, were Albany pioneers from Illinois, and they established a dairy farm uh, in 1864, a 320-acre farm or donation land claim, three and a half miles southeast of uh, Albany, just south of the South Albany uh, High School. In 1885, when he retired from dairy farming and moved into Albany, uh, their home was at 9th and, and Baker Street, which is now the off-ramp for off of Pacific Boulevard into Albany. Um, the Strouders uh, was one of the organizers of the Albany Creamery Association in 1895 and served as its president of the board of directors for the Albany Creamery Association. His brother uh, Thomas Froman II was, uh, had served as also as a director. The Albany Creamery uh, was first established, like I said, in 1895 at the uh, corner of 9th and Madison Street here in Albany. Now it is where at-home furniture is located uh, in present-day Albany. Uh, it was the first cooperative creamery association in Oregon and the first creamery plant in the Willamette Valley. This is some of their molding apparatus and uh, combined churn. Uh, and this was about in, back in night, about 1900. Um, during this time, the creamery was the largest and most modern in Oregon. The creamery was also uh, known for uh, its Lynn butter. Uh, the creamery received many awards for its butter, including its silver medals at the 1930 National Dairy Exposition in St. Louis, Missouri. Manford McCroskey, one of Albany's creamery butter makers, was the 1905 Oregon Dairy Association champion butter maker. And even today, Albany has an award-winning cheesemaker, Francisco Ochoa, um, but I'm gonna talk a little more about him later. The Albany Creamery included the Lynn Butter in its advertisement as well and Lynn Butter was, became a well-known brand on the West Coast. They did a little extra advertising uh, using uh, Daniel Berge's uh, draft horses uh, and his team of horses. Uh, they put their advertising on the side of the wagon and then uh, here Lynn Butter is on parade at one of the many Northwest County Fair events. Even Albany vendor uh, Thomas Caniff with the City Pride Wagon used the Albany Creamery butter to promote his popcorn sales. Uh, his quote was uh, saying, I use Albany Creamery Association butter. And that helped with his popcorn sales. Unfortunately, a fire destroyed the Albany Creamery on May 1st, 1921 for a total loss of uh, $25,000 and their insurance only covered $9,000. Um, but the total loss in today's dollars would be over $360,000. The Almond Creamery Association uh, or the Lynn Creamery reopened at 2nd and Washington Street on November the 15th, 1921. Um, this was the original site of the Anson Marshall livery stables that was destroyed by fire itself. Um, and this uh, became one of the first modern 
cement block buildings in downtown Albany. The Albany Creamery uh, or Lynn Creamery also had a popular ice cream shop. The Creamery closed in 1957, but today at 2nd and Washington Street is now the Ray Bar Professional uh, Center building. If you use your imagination, you can kind of see parts of the Creamery still in the architecture of the building. The Albany Butter and Produce Company um, moved into the former Albany Christian um, Church building and was also once a part of the old Madison School. And this was at 440 East Fifth Avenue here in Albany. The Albany Butter and Produce Company uh, or Albany Pure Milk Ice, Ice Cream and Butter Company um, it originally started on October the 3rd, 1900 by Elmer Seeley, Curtis Wynn, William Frazier, Llewellyn Marshall, who, and Marshall, who later became their president of the Albany Butter and Produce Company. Albany Butter and Produce Company's ice cream was a popular item at a lot of local events. The Cloak Produce Company also uh, took over the building in, in 19. 13, and that's, uh, excuse me, that's Clock Produce Company. And then later, uh, Pate's Creamery, uh, operated by Frank Pate. Uh, and then he sold it uh, in 1943 to the Reeser's Creamery, operated by Edward Reeser, uh, formerly the butter maker of Albany Creamery. And then it closed uh, in 1956. When it was Pate's Creamery, the building had a, a fire in 1941. It was not completely destroyed because today it's a private residence at uh, 440 East Fifth Avenue, or in other words, at Fifth and Jackson Street. At Jefferson Street and Water Avenue, the Oregon Milk Company uh, moved into this building in 1929, and it served uh, it was mainly, they moved there because it was served by the railroad. It was right next to the railroad tracks. And on June the 1st, 1929, the Borden Milk Products Company took over the plant and Borden stayed in operation for 34 years and then closed upon taking the last delivery of milk uh, on July 31st, 1963. Once the product made here came from, from local dairies. Now at Jefferson Street and Water Avenue is the Deluxe Brewery. The product made here now probably goes to a dairy farm. What? Ma's Dairy Farm. Now, I have never found out for sure why Ma's Dairy Farm got its name. Uh, however, it got its name about the same time as there were other um, uh, places called Mother's Mattress Factory, Granny's Granary. Uh, this was also the site of uh, the Oasis Cafe. So if anybody knows how it got Ma's Dairy Farm, I would like to know. At uh, 220 West 2nd Avenue, uh, the site of Broder's Meat uh, Company. Uh, next door to it was uh, Setter's Grocery and Haynes uh, Restaurant. And then in 1912, the Bowl Creamery moved in and stayed until 1933. The, the Bowles also had a creamery in Lebanon uh, under the name of Bowles Brothers Creamery and then later was known as Timber Valley. But then uh, the, all, the Snow Peak Dairy moved into the, uh, the Bowl Creamery building. Today we know it as Novak's Hungarian Restaurant. Snow Peak moved in 1944 to 330 West 3rd Avenue, uh, which is now the Lynn County Offices for General Services and Veteran Services. And these were the, the owners the, um, and drivers for the Creamery, Tom Holly and Floyd Holtman, who was the owner, uh, Ruth Craig, who, who was the other owner of the Creamery, um, Clint Vosper was a bottler, Frank Faulkner, who was the bookkeeper, 
or Francis Faulkner, who was a bookkeeper, Lloyd Swanson, uh, Helen White, who was also another bookkeeper, uh, Mel Burke, who was a driver, Art Oling was a driver, and Jack Pyburn, a driver, and uh, Dale Wallace, another driver for the for Snow Peak, and then Jack Ragsdale was the plant foreman. And Bernie Davis, who's standing in the back, was uh, also one of their drivers. So why do we need a driver? Um, because all you had to do was to order what you wanted and it, your milk produce, uh, ice cream, cheeses, or whatever was brought to your front door. By using these vehicles. These were called DIFCO delivery trucks. And the DIFCO is an acronym which stands for Detroit Industrial Vehicles Company. Uh, the trucks were produced between 1926 and 1986. Uh, DIFCO was well known for its pioneering multi-stop delivery trucks, especially for home delivery milk trucks. A lot of people remember Snow Peak ice cream as, as their favorite. Snow Peak closed its operation in 1976, and so people were no longer getting their milk uh, directly from a local creamery. There were many other creameries in Albany as well over the years. Even Swift and Company had a creamery at uh, 128 Ferry. Uh, Albany Produce Company uh, also on Ferry Street uh, and the Shook uh, Produce and Creamery. There was Arden Farms, are also known as the Western Dairy Products uh, Company, and they their main uh, product was ice cream. And then there was the Washington Creamery at Front and Baker Street. The Swift Creamery was um, uh, also took over uh, Nevergalls as well later on. At Second and Ferry Street, uh, where uh, was the uh, where Swift and Company was once located at the at the foot of Broad Alvin Street, and um, they uh, and the variety of other they were located at a variety of other places as well here in Albany. Later, uh, like I said, Swift took over uh, another a location where the Nevergall Meat Company was located here in Albany at Front and uh, Waverly Streets, near where Talking Gardens and uh, Waverly Lake are located. Today, uh, where these creamers were located is now where the uh, Legman Property Management uh, Facility is located here at Alb in Albany. The Western Dairy Products eventually became Arden Farms and they were located very conveniently next to Albany's, uh, uh, ice, Albany's ice and storage house on 3rd Street. Today, uh, the location for the creamery as well as the ice house uh, is the Riverview Place Apartments. Today, um, then there was also the uh, Washington Creamery at Front and Baker Street uh, and um, they were located near where Smith Glass Shop is today. And then um, there was also the uh, Hazelwood Cream Station, um, which is now, if you take a look at the picture in the lower corner, uh, is now the drive up uh, station at the US Bank. Today, we still have uh, an Albany Creamery. It's the Albany che Cheesemakers, Ochoa's, uh, Quisaria and La Mariposa uh, at 815 First Avenue East. One of Albany's, uh, it's one of Albany's best known secrets and the fact that it, it's uh, home to not just one, but two great cheesemakers that use milk from local farms. La Mariposa and Ochoa's uh, cooperatively share uh, the equipment in the facility. Uh, they make high quality cheeses 
and Francisco and and Lisa, the owners for the our cheese makers, and um, Mariano and Savannah um, Batro are the uh, makers there at La uh, Mariposa. Albany also had many raw milk dairies. And what do I mean by that? that this, these were dairies that produced and sold directly uh, milk from their dairies. Uh, and there at one time were over 20 dairies in Albany that uh, at one time, and they actually sold their milk door to door. And there were, like I said, many of them. Uh, these are just a few of the um, raw milk dairy, dairies in Albany. And just a few more raw milk dairies in Albany and even more. The Golden Rule Dairy or the Palmer Dairy was operated by Hiram and Electra Palmer. Um, Hiram was once the Lynn County judge and the Riverside uh, Jersey Dairy was operated by their son and daughter-in-law, uh, JB and Alice Palmer at 314, or excuse me, 514 Elm Street. This is what their home looks like today at 514 Elm Street. Another uh, dairy was the Mishler Brothers Dairy operated by Daniel and Ben Mishler. Uh, they later, uh, in 1909, the dairy was known as uh, Cloverleaf Dairy. And with this dairy was located uh, near where the Holloway Market was back then. Uh, today, it's the Bamboo Valley business in North Albany. The Wayside Dairy, operated by Ed and um, Louise Pilloud um, near the Millersburg area, just across the road from our west of the former location of Western Craft. And then Sunrise Dairy, uh, operated by Band and, and Mildred Bishop on Marion Street, uh, near the present day Sunrise uh, Grade School and Sunrise Park, and in other words, the Sunrise District of Albany. It's possibly the namesake for my 4-H club that I uh, belong to, the Sunrise Dairy 4-H Club, since many of our members were actually lived in the Sunrise District here in Albany. Then there was the Riverwood Dairy. The Riverwood, Riverwood Dairy was uh, uh, on Church Drive and uh, near uh, South Oakville Road. Uh, the barn was built in 1925 uh, by Herman Holston, Holstein and uh, Dent Stewart laid the concrete. It was one of the longest built barns in Lane County. It pres uh, is presently managed by the Bannockburn Farms. And uh, at the time, the, the, uh, there was a dairy herd of Jersey cows and the, the dairy was operated by Hector McPherson and Hector McPherson's son, Hector McPherson, until 1988. The cement block milking parlor and milk house date back to 1960. Some of you may remember uh, Hector and Catherine McPherson. Another dairy uh, was the Nola Valentine uh, Shelby and Sons Dairy. Um, in the uh, Knox Butte Scrabble here, Hill area. And they advertised that they did also their own delivery and uh, of their raw milk. This was the Shelby Jersey Dairy Farm and actually back in 19, this picture was taken back in 1945. Then there was the Nigren Brothers Dairy, operated by Carl and Oscar, uh, and it was located near Durf Lake and the Wat, what we know as the Durf Lake and Wa Chang area. Carl and Persis Nigren 
and their children, Bunny, Luann, Jim, Charlotte, and Jean, uh, all help with the dairy. And they, the, since they sold their raw milk, they also needed a city license to sell their raw milk. Father Carl Nigren with his delivery truck. And Jean with his prize winning jersey. There was also Cooley's Dairy, which operated a, a drive in uh, dairy that was just um, that started at 2105 East Queen Avenue by Milton and Milton Cooley, uh, father and son. Uh, and in 1961, they moved the dairy part of it to. to uh, 1650 Never Gall Loop and continue to have a drive in dairy at both locations. Uh, Lynn County dairies, uh, uh, prior to World War I, there were over 400 in the county. In 1950, uh, there were over 300. In 1970s, there was less than 50. Today, there's only eight, with two still in Albany. Yes, I'm as shocked as, as you are, but uh, things have changed over the years. Uh, the cost of dairy farming has, has increased. Uh, and the, but however, the amount of milk production per, per cow has gone up. And um, so fewer animals are needed um, and fewer dairies are needed to produce the same amount of milk. However, there were, uh, over the years, many dairies were located in Albany. Uh, some even with, within today's city limits. Here are just a few. And a few more. And a few more. And even more. But let's take a look at uh, some of these uh, many dairies that uh, let's go take a, a visit to see what uh, where they were located and and maybe what some of them looked like at the time. One of the dairies uh, was the Maple Lawn Place Dairy owned by Robert and Marguerite Burkhart. Uh, they were uh, Robert was the leader of the Oregon Jersey Cattle Club and the Oregon Dairy Association. And the Burkhart's jerseys. Uh, Interest resulted in 90% of the dairy cattle in Lynn County were jerseys. In 1912, there was even more registered jerseys in Lynn County than any other Oregon County. They had a dispersal sale in 1912 and their total sales at that time was $16,740, which today is over, was over 450,000. And today's dollars is over $450,000. One of their, uh, the Burkhart's jerseys uh, were known worldwide. Uh, Jean Marigold of St. Ma's was the, uh, was the champion butter fat cow of the world. Uh, she was 16 years old uh, when this picture was taken. Uh, she was producing 10,926 pounds of milk and 666 pounds of butter fat. Shortly after this photo was taken, shortly after this photo was taken, um, the Burkharts uh, sold uh, Maple Lawn and his his dairy, but they kept Jean Marigold as the family's cow. That's the their dairy uh, and Maple Lawn was also the, the site for the Jersey Jubilee. And this event involved uh, the mayor, uh, Laughlin Curl at the time and the Albany Commercial Club, now we know it as the Albany Chamber of Commerce. And there were participants from all over the United States and, and Oregon that were members of the American Jersey Cattle Club and the Oregon Jersey Cattle Associations. And people came from Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and Montana to the event. The 
the Maple Lawn Place was the home, like I said, of Robert and Marguerite Burkhart. Today, we now know it as the Maple Lawn Park, which is the City of Albany's Parks and Recreation Department. Then there was the Klein Dairy, a Jersey Dairy uh, operated by George and, and Nellie Klein on Riverside Drive. George was the director and vice president of Albany's Premier Association and started as a, it started out as a donation land claim in 1864 and operated as a dairy until the 1930s. And, this, and the barn is still there on the site. The Stetsman Dairy, operated by Gordon and Gladys Stetsman and Dan and, and Rachel Stetsman, was uh, in Albany, between, between Albany and Cottonwoods. This is uh, Gladys Stetsman and her daughter Yvonne out herding the cows. Rachel Stetsman's uh, uh, daughter Marcia and a neighbor, Sam Iker Jr., uh, were in the milking parlor. And if you note real, in the photograph, there is a radio in the middle of the photograph uh, that was probably playing during milking time. This is an aerial photo of where uh, the Philbeth Jersey Dairy was on, on Riverside Drive in the lower uh, left-hand corner of the photograph. Philip and Elizabeth Haddon uh, Dairy um, included, uh, uh, or the Philbeth Jersey Farm, uh, their children, uh, Phyllis uh, and Charlotte uh, on Riverside uh, Drive. This is Philip and uh, with along with Phyllis and, uh, and Charlotte in the hay wagon. And here's Charlotte Haddon, now Charlotte Haddon Hauser with her Jersey calf. Their next door neighbor uh, was John Buckner with his, and here he is with his Jersey uh, Topsy. And John also uh, had enough cows and he bottled his own milk and sold it. Uh, his raw milk to people in the neighborhood. Today, uh, there is the Royal Riverside Farm on, near Riverside Drive and Bryant Drive in Albany. Uh, it opened in the year 2018, and it's the only farmstead creamery in the mid Willamette Valley. The farm milks 15 cows, mostly Jerseys, and bottles milk for, for sale at over 25 local stores from Hood River to Eugene. The dairy is owned and operated by the, the Cron family, Father Ben, uh, Mother Amy, and their daughters Gracie and Clancy. Their dairy offers the only locally produced cream line milk. Cream line milk is one of the most uh, natural forms of milk. It is pasteurized but not homogenized. homogenized homogenization is the process after pasteurization where the milk is mixed and the cream line or the fat content is permanently mixed into the body of the milk. So when you get their milk, uh, the cream is probably floating to the top in the bottle. So I'm gonna to talk to you about another dairy. In the beginning, uh, our dairy started on Hill Street in Albany when it was a rural area and the streets were not paved yet. We had horses and cows on our property. And these were the first few uh, members of our herd of the Albany, or excuse me, the Maddie Dairy Farm on South Hill Street. Well, in about 1953, we were looking at uh, moving to another uh, farm property owned by my grandparents. Um, so, we were thinking about starting or continuing the dairy. And uh, this was also at the time that uh, milk production was increasing per cow at, and rapidly. And um, so that was a consideration that we thought about for sure. And I, I wanted to make sure that uh, I read about that. Well, this was a good decision for us to make. Uh, even at a young age, I could still, I could read the newspaper. Now, if you believe that part of my story, I have a few others I can share with you. So in 1953, the Maddie family uh, moved to our new farm two miles south of Albany, and we established the Maddie Farms Dairy on South Pacific Highway. 
This was our home and our barn and our milking parlor were all combined on our property. Our barn was similar to this one where the hay could be uh, lifted up and put into the hay loft both manually as well as with mechanic by mechanical means. Today the uh, the location of our, our dairy is now the Lake Shores Lanes Bowling Alley and Miniature Golf. Maddie Farms Dairy, we included uh, 55 dairy cows. And um, a lot of people don't know this, but my dad was uh, chief of police at the time here in Albany and he, he milked cows before going to work. And my brothers and I, milk the cows before going to school. Of those 55 uh, dairy animals, uh, 40 were milking and we had 15 heifers and calves. And we were one of the highest producing grade A dairies in Lynn County at the time. And this was an article submitted by the Snow Peak Dairy to advertise uh, their dairy products uh, to the community back in 1956. We also helped advertise on our property, uh, Snow Peak Dairy products. And this is how we got our milk from our farm to uh, Snow Peak Dairy. Uh, the cans were picked up, but um, eventually we, we went to a bulk tank uh, when we were producing quite a bit of milk. Fences are very important on the dairy. And once in a while we have someone that might leave a gate open, then we've got a problem. Because when the cows get out, it, it literally is utter chaos. And boy, those ro roses sure taste a lot better in your neighbor's yard than your own. So the grass is always greener on the other side. So the, um, at one time in the early years uh, in Lynn County, uh, they hosted a, the Jersey Cattle Show in Albany. And this was held at the Bryant, at Bryant Park Chautauqua building. There was also the Lynn Benton Spring Dairy Show. We, there was a separate show from the county fair simply because there were so many dairies in the area that justified having a separate uh, exhibition. Here my brothers uh, are getting ready for the county fair. And there were lots of dairy animals at even at the at the Lane County Fair for 4-H and FFA. My brother in the middle had the champion Holstein cow from at the Lynn County Fair this particular year, along with uh, Gene Fisher, who had the champion Jersey, Gloria Sturgis had the ch uh, champion Ayrshire, and Bill Parsons had the champion Milking Shorthorn, Shorthorn, and Judy Henderson had the champion Guernsey. This photo was taken in the area that is now the uh, dairy product section at Costco. And even John Buckner with his Jersey heifer Topsy was getting ready. Here he is getting ready for the Forage Dairy, Dairy Showmanship Contest at the Lynn County Fair. Many of our uh, dairy animals, uh, especially when they were our 4-H projects, were Champion Holsteins. Here's our uh, Champion Holstein Bessie. Now, why am I showing this water or this milk can again? Because at the county fair, the water that was used was city water. It had chlorine in it, and our cows would not drink chlorine, chlorinated water for some reason. So we would we would pack um, water from our dairy, from our well, to the county fair. It was very laborious, but uh, it got the job done. 
1956, we decided to have our own dispersal sale like the Burkhards did. Uh, and we had 33 uh, head of uh, dairy animals to be sold. And then we had another sale in 1960. And Dan Roth was the auctioneer and going once, twice, and our dairy, most of our dairy animals were sold. Um, and the sale reduced our herd to 22, 22 head of, of our 4 H cows, heifers, and calves. And here's uh, Bessie the Champion Holstein from the county fair with twin calves, uh, Maddie Farms, Phoebe, Inca, Dixie, and Trixie. And Trixie's on the right, or excuse me, Dixie's on the right, Trixie's on the left, and Dixie was my 4 H project that I went to the county fair with and was champion dairy showman at the county fair. Now, uh, where uh, this photograph was taken is uh, about lane number six at the bowling alley. At the Oregon State Fair, uh, I was champion showman as well with my Holstein cow now, uh, Dixie. When the awards are uh, memories, but the, the, and the memories live on, life on a dairy farm, um, is some of the, the memories that we have, especially that you learn the personalities of cows, like the, um, the California Dairy Association cow or the Yoplait cow or the Dairy Pure cows, all have personalities. But some of the memories that I have as a dairy kid are related to what it's like to be a dairy farmer. You might be a dairy farmer if you can accurately weigh a cow with your eyes and be within 50 pounds. Or if you've ever gotten an award for fat and we're proud of it. You might be a dairy farmer if your medicine cabinet contains a container of bag bomb. Or if you've had a drink of milk straight out of the milk pipeline or the cow. You might be a dairy farmer if your idea of overnight delivery is pulling a calf at three in the morning. Or if you can remember the name of every cow on your farm and you have more photos of your cows than your children. You might be a dairy farmer if whenever a a city friend grimaces about the smell of a dairy you're passing on the road, you, you have said, smells like money. Or you laugh when your friends complain about having to work on a Saturday. Or if the manure is often a topic of conversation with friends at a fancy restaurant. Or you've experienced a wet tail in the face before breakfast. You might be a dairy farmer if you can back a manure spreader up with your eyes closed. You can fix a fence or anything with baler twine, a piece of wire, duct tape, or, or a pair of vice grips. Or if you cry a little when Paul Harvey said it all with some slight paraphrasing, and on the eighth day, God looked down on his planned paradise and said, I need a caretaker. So God made a dairy farmer. God said, I need somebody willing to get up before dawn, make milk cows, working all day in the fields. Milk cows again, eat supper, then go to the town and stay past midnight at a meeting of the school board or lead a 4-H club the next night. Then back, head back to the barn after midnight to check on a newborn calf or with gentle hands, help a heifer give birth to her first calf. So God made a dairy farmer. There's a lot of people I wanna thank that uh, 
Um, all we have, we owe to others, um, but there were a lot of people that helped uh, me with resources for this program that I'm pre I presented. A lot of dairies in the area. And I wanna make sure that everybody knows that no animals were harmed in making this production. No cats, dairy animals, dairy farmers, or dairy farm children were harmed during any part of the program. As Will Rogers once said, never miss a good chance to shut up. And so that's the end of my utter story. Well, thank you, Bill. Uh, that was a really fun presentation. Uh, plenty of puns and moments to laugh and uh, really nice history about your, your own personal history and the history of Albany. We'll give it just a few, maybe a minute, uh, see if any questions come in. I didn't have any come in on Facebook um, during the presentation, but we'll see. Um, we had a couple people make their own puns in the comments, um, such as Cameron Settlemeyer said, holy cow, I had no idea <laughs> Albany had so many dairies. <laughs> One bit, of one bit of trivia, Keith, that um, uh, today, you know, July the 8th um, and 1800, and today, today is July the 8th, uh, commemorates the, uh, when uh, United States doctor, Dr. Uh, Benjamin Waterhouse gave the first cowpox vaccination uh, in the United States to his son to prevent smallpox. And the story goes is that in 1896, an English physician, Edward Jenner, uh, made history when he gave uh, a young boy uh, what became known as the first vaccine made from cowpox virus, which is what cows were getting, uh, but they, they, but the, the virus came from other animals like rats and mice and that type of thing. Um, but he observed that dairy farmers, specifically milkmaids, uh, the, the people who milked the cows, were not getting smallpox because they had been exposed to this cowpox virus. And uh, so, and even the word uh, uh, vaccine is derived from vaca, which is Latin for cow. So I think we, the dairy farmers can get a lot of credit for the smallpox, smallpox vaccine. Maybe there's, uh, maybe they might, maybe dairy farmers might have a solution to <laughs> our pandemic issue right now with the corona um, virus. <laughs> that, would, that would be good. That'd be nice. Yeah. Uh, so we've got a couple questions. Uh, so we've got one from uh, Cameron Settlemeyer. Uh, it is, what is the reason for increase in milk production per cow? Uh, well, one of those is uh, record keeping and management of the different uh, dairy breeds the, through um, one of the programs was called DHIA, Dairy Herd Improvement Association. And it was a record keeping thing where you could see which cows were producing uh, better than others. So you could compare, you could compare the animals. Uh, and, and therefore you knew uh, through a good breeding program, which animals would uh, be the good, best producers for your dairy. And, uh, that is something that's been learned through, again, through record keeping, good record keeping. And that's how, why uh, milk started uh, increasing, as well as more information about nutrition and supplements and that sort of thing that help uh, stimulate uh, growth and, and development of a dairy animal. Interesting. Okay. So uh, science, science was the, was the key to a lot of it. And a good um, uh, breeding programs as well. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, so we have our second question uh, is from a Kristen uh, and her question is, how much was a gallon of raw milk worth in 1946? Uh, that's a good question. Um, if you hold on a second, I can get an answer for you on what it's worth uh, today, but um, the, um, um, I, I don't have the answer to that one right off the top of my head, but uh, um, the, 
the value of milk per dairy though is, is quite um, quite high and that's what keeps some some dairy farmers still in business is because of the value of, of milk however at the time uh, milk was probably was, would be a, a lot less than what it is uh, today uh, per gallon many because of inflation but um, I think that uh, uh, milk was more affordable uh, early on as well. Great. Uh, well, and part and part of that increase in cost, uh, and not, not, unfortunately, not the dairy farmers aren't always the ones that are seeing the the increase in, in milk values. Um, that that was one of the reasons why there was uh, what was called dairy quotas um, that were. Um, limited uh, dairy farmers from, you know, from producing too much milk. Uh, but uh, it was to help keep the, pri the price of milk up. So the dairy farmer was still getting the value that they needed to be able to stay in business. And uh, the, uh, so milk has increased over the years also because of environmental issues, believe it or not, because the cost of uh, controlling the waste from dairies uh, has increased and, and the cost of uh, milking machines, uh, milking equipment has increased as well. And maintaining a dairy is very expensive. So those costs have um, caused uh, the price of milk to go up so that the dairy farmer is, can still afford to stay in business. All right. Well, thank you for the very thorough answers. That wasn't, well, that wasn't a direct answer to what, what it cost back then, but I, I did a little more research to remember what it cost. But I do remember seeing milk for, for less than a dollar in the grocery store yeah. per gallon. Uh, well, um, I want to say thank you, Bill. Uh, we didn't have any other questions come in, but um, people will continue to watch this video. Um, it's available on Facebook. It'll also be available on YouTube. So if anything else comes in, I'll let you know and we can get an answer up for those folks. Be happy to. Uh, but otherwise, thanks for the great presentation.